Chapter Seven of Narrative of an Expedition to the Shores of the Arctic Sea in eighteen forty six and eighteen forty seven by John Ray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter Seven Preparations for Exploring the Coast of Melville Peninsula. Outfit Leave Fort Hope. Pass over numerous lakes. Guide at fault. Dease Peninsula. Arrive at the sea. Fatigue party sent back to Fort Hope. Barrier of ice. Lafroy Bay. Large island named after the Prince of Wales. Detained by stormy weather. Short allowance. Cape Lady Simpson. Selkirk Bay. Snow knee deep. Capes Finlayson and Sibbald. Deer shot. A cooking scene. Favorite native relish. Again stopped by stormy weather. Cape Malaughlin. Two men left to hunt and fish. Cape Richardson. Chain of Islands. Gary Bay. Prince Albert Range of Hills. Cape Arrowsmith. Coast much indented. Baker Bay. Provisions fail. Proceed with one man. Cape Crozier, Perry Bay, Cape Ellis, the farthest point seen, take possession, commence our return, no provisions procured by the men left behind, short commons, flock of cranes, snow blindness, arrive at Repulse Bay. On the 12th of May, preparations were commenced for a journey along the west side of Melville Peninsula. In expectation of falling in with much rough ice, I determined on taking dogs only for the first three days of the journey. The party was to consist of Corrigal, our snow house builder, Folster, Matheson, and Minot, with Uligbuck as deer hunter and interpreter. A fatigue party of two men and an Eskimo with a sledge and a good team of dogs were to accompany us for three days, which I supposed would be the time required to reach the coast our provisions for the journey were two bags of pemmican each ninety pounds seventy reindeer tongues weighing nearly thirty pounds thirty-six pounds flour and a little tea chocolate and sugar we took also a gallon and a half of alcohol and a small quantity of oil leaving george flett in charge of fort hope we started at ten p m on the thirteenth of may and directed our course towards a chain of lakes in nearly a due north direction Although the snow was soft, and we had some rather steep rising ground to pass over, we made good progress, and after crossing six small lakes we came to some high tableland, on which the snow was very deep, and in which the sledge sank very much. A walk of four miles brought us to another lake of considerable size. A little after six a.m. on the 14th, we found some snow huts that had been inhabited during part of the winter by the Eskimo Akuchi and soon had one of them cleared out for the accommodation of the party. Although we had not travelled much more than twenty miles, Uligbuck was so fatigued that I determined to send him back with those who were to return to Repulse Bay. We saw no game and only very few tracks of deer. The weather was so cloudy that no meridian observation of the sun could be obtained. Our latitude was sixty-six degrees, fifty-two minutes north and longitude 86 degrees 46 minutes west, both by account. We resumed our march at 9 p.m. on the 14th, the night being calm, with the little snow falling. A brisk walk of two miles to the northwest brought us to the end of the lake, when we followed the bed of a small stream to the northward for five miles. Two narrow lakes were next traversed, when our guide, who appeared to know little about the proper route, led us to the northwest and after crossing five lakelets and as many short portages at half past six a m we came to a body of water about the size of that near which we had encamped the day before here we stopped for the day the ice on the lake was six feet thick and gave the men much trouble to cut through it there was very little fuel to be found we were therefore obliged to burn part of the small quantity of oil we had taken with us by a meridian observation our latitude was sixty seven degrees five minutes three seconds north 
variation of the compass fifty three degrees thirty minutes west and longitude by account eighty seven degrees eight minutes fifty four seconds west the west side of the creek and also of the lakes which we passed over this day was steep and rocky although not high the east sides were more sloping it was near ten o'clock at night when we commenced our journey after an hour's walk we came to the north end of the lake but our young eskimo never having been here before which was rather surprising as his usual winter home was not more than ten miles distant was quite at a loss what direction to take it would have been quite easy for me to have made a straight course by compass but by doing so we were very likely to get among ground so uneven as to be impassable to the dogs and sledge we now turned to the east of north and after crossing a number of small lakes arrived at the sea which here formed a deep inlet at a few minutes before midnight proceeding down the inlet which for a couple of leagues was not more than half a mile wide with steep rocky shores in some places precipitous we came to rough ice and found that there were apparently two openings leading to the northward i chose the one on the left but we had not gone more than a mile and a half when we found that we were in an arm of the inlet and that the land to the north of us which i had supposed to be an island was joined to the mainland by an isthmus not more than fifty yards wide this peninsula i named after p w deese esq the able leader in conjunction with t simpson of the expeditions which explored so large a portion of the arctic shores in eighteen thirty seven eighteen thirty eight and eighteen thirty nine retracing our steps we now followed the opening to the right in which there were great quantities of rough ice over which we advanced but slowly the inlet to which i had given the name of cameron after a friend soon became broader and the ice less rough at seven a m on the sixteenth we arrived at the cape which last autumn had been named after the late thomas simpson whose agreeable duty it would have been had he survived to accomplish the survey which i was now endeavouring to bring to a successful termination the shores here were very barren there being little or no vegetation to be seen except small patches in the crevices of the rocks in a small lake near our encampment from which we obtained water the ice was found to be five feet thick a sufficient quantity of fuel was gathered to boil our kettle and two hares were shot by corrigal we here made a cache of some pemmican flour etc for our return journey our snow hut was built on the south side of the cape under shelter of rocks near which there were two small islands the sledge was to be sent back to repulse bay from this place and with it uligbuk who from his inability to walk would have been an encumbrance to us the weather was so cloudy that no observation could be obtained our latitude by account was sixty seven degrees twenty two minutes which i afterwards found by observation to be nearly three miles too far north longitude eighty seven degrees three minutes west the whole of these three days journeys had been measured with a well-stretched line but this we could not expect to carry on further as each person would have enough to do with his load bidding adieu to our companions who were to return to fort hope we commenced our journey at half past eight p m each of my men being laden with about seventy pounds whilst i carried my instruments books and some other articles weighing altogether forty pounds this was but a light burden for me but as i had to examine different objects on the route and also lead the way i found it quite enough as soon as we had fairly rounded cape t simpson the coast turned to the eastward and became indented with narrow but deep inlets all of which were packed full of rough ice walking became most difficult at one moment we sank nearly waist-deep in snow at another we were up to our knees in salt water and then again on a piece of ice so slippery that with our wet and frozen shoes it was impossible to keep from falling sometimes we had to crawl out of a hole on all fours like some strange-looking quadrupeds at other times falling backwards we were so hampered by the weight of our loads that it was impossible to rise without throwing them off or being assisted by one of our companions we therefore found it better to follow the shores of the inlets than to cross them although by doing so we had doubled the distance to go over numerous traces of hares were seen but we could not afford to lose time in following them 
after passing four inlets having some small islands lying outside of them we came to a rocky point rather higher than any we had yet met with on this side of the bay the coast to the eastward of point cowie so named after an old friend became more level and instead of granite was covered with mud shingle and fragments of limestone at half past three a m all of us being sufficiently tired with our night's work we built our snow hut and a small kitchen for cooking this was our usual practice when we had found or were likely to find fuel in the present instance we had the good fortune to collect enough to boil a kettle of chocolate and we consequently enjoyed an excellent supper if i may so term a meal taken about six in the morning the weather had been fine until midnight when it began to snow and drift with a strong breeze from the north thermometer plus thirteen degrees at noon the sky was too much overcast to obtain an observation our latitude was sixty seven degrees twenty four minutes twenty seconds north longitude eighty six degrees thirty seven minutes west both by account when we resumed our journey at seven o'clock in the evening of the seventeenth there was still a strong breeze from the north northwest with snow drift the temperature being plus eighteen degrees our snow hut of the previous day we now found to be on the shore of a large bay the most distant point of which bore nearly due north to follow the coast would have cost us a great deal of additional walking i therefore determined to attempt the traverse of the bay towards the point above referred to all along the coast there was a belt of rough ice about two miles broad over which we were forced to pass before reaching some that appeared smoother outside to cross this barrier occupied us more than two hours and gave us more violent exercise than all the remainder of the day's journey it was half past three a m when we arrived at the north point of the bay which was low and level with some hills a few hundred feet high three or four miles inland we had passed two small rocky islands to seaward in the first part of the night and there was another close to a bluff point on the south side of the bay to this cape i gave the name of watt the bay was called after lieutenant now captain lefroy of the royal artillery whose name is well known to the scientific world and of whose kindness in aiding me in my astronomical studies i retain a most grateful remembrance we crossed over to cape w mctavish so named after william mctavish esq chief trader and intimate friend to whom i am much indebted for assisting me in fitting out the expedition and stopped about three miles beyond it here we built our snow hut which was found by meridian observation to be in latitude sixty seven degrees forty two minutes twenty two seconds north the variation of the compass eighty degrees thirty five minutes west and the longitude by account eighty six degrees thirty minutes west directly opposite our encampment and extending for about seventeen miles to the northward of it there was a large island of tableland with not a single rock in situ to be seen on it its southern extremity bore nearly west true from us and the strait which separated it from the mainland was not more than a mile and a half wide this island was honoured with the name of his royal highness the prince of wales and a smaller one to the south of it was named after colonel sabine not a single living animal had been seen all day but some traces of deer proceeding northward were noticed we were again fortunate enough to find a little fuel our route on the following night was nearly straight in a north northeast direction the snow was very soft and deep in many places a few hundred yards from the beach there were steep banks covered with shingle and small boulders of granite where we usually found the snow less deep and walking consequently better after travelling nine miles we came to a considerable creek about twenty yards wide in which a deep channel had been worn among the mud and shingle near it there were numerous eskimo marks set up and circular tent sites but all of old date we continued our march twelve miles further and at eight a m arrived at another creek somewhat larger than the last and with higher banks here there were also many eskimo marks and i afterwards learned that some parties had resorted hither from repulse bay for the purpose of catching salmon trout etc about an hour before reaching this place we crossed a long and curiously shaped point which i named point hamilton after a near relative 
the bay formed by it was called erlandson one of the men although an able active fellow not being used to this sort of exercise was much fatigued and as the weather looked threatening i ordered our snow house to be built the more readily as there was fuel to be found in little more than an hour and a half we were comfortably housed and not long afterwards we had taken our usual morning meal of pemmican seasoned with a handful of flour those forming when boiled together a very nourishing and not unpalatable dish the temperature all night had been twenty two degrees above zero being too warm for walking pleasantly and the men having had to exert themselves much were glad to get to rest as soon as possible whilst i remained up to obtain a meridian observation of the sun this gave latitude sixty seven degrees fifty eight minutes forty nine seconds north our longitude by account was eighty five degrees fifty nine minutes thirty six seconds west the sun was too much obscured by clouds to obtain the variation we here deposited some pemmican and a little flour for our return journey when we started at eight hours thirty minutes p m on the nineteenth it blew a gale of wind from the south southeast with much drift and snow the temperature being only four degrees below the freezing point fortunately the wind was on our backs but the drift was so thick that we were obliged to follow every turn of the coast and we could not see more than twenty yards before us when we had travelled six miles we came to a bay a mile and a half wide on the north shore of which there were two strangely shaped rocks of granite having the appearance of an old ruin or portion of a fortress they were of a square form about twenty-five feet high and nearly as much in extent our course now lay due north but we had not gone more than twelve miles altogether when the weather became so unpleasant that we were glad to get under shelter and before we did so every part of our clothes was penetrated with snowdrift we could obtain no fuel here the weather continued so stormy that we were unable to leave our snow hut until a quarter past eight p m on the twenty first during our detention finding that our provisions would run short if the walking continued as difficult as it had been we took only one not over abundant meal during the twenty-four hours there was still some snow falling so that i could not take the proper bearings of the land along which we passed the land after we had proceeded northeast for a few miles turned to the southward of east forming a bay eight miles wide which as it was full of rough ice we were under the necessity of coasting this bay was called after the right honourable the earl of selkirk and the cape forming its western boundary was named after the amiable lady of our much respected governor sir george simpson the snow was in many places so soft and deep that we sank above the knee at every step which made our night's march fatiguing in the extreme on the northeast side of selkirk bay which is steep and rocky there was a deep indentation or inlet into which two small creeks emptied themselves the land for five miles had a northwest trending and again turned up to the eastward of north forming a high rugged headland which was named cape finlayson after duncan finlayson esq chief factor at three miles from cape finlayson we passed point barnston and about four miles beyond this we came to another rocky point which received the name of cape sibold the night had now become very disagreeable with a heavy fall of snow we persevered notwithstanding partly crossing and partly coasting a bay heaped with rough ice and encamped on what i supposed was its northern extremity but which afterwards turned out to be an island and to which i gave the name of glen the bay we had just passed was called after william g smith esq assistant secretary to the hudson's bay company the snow not being in a good state for building we were rather longer than usual in getting housed there was no fuel to be found so we followed our old plan and took a kettle or two of snow to bed with us the temperature was very high for the season being only five degrees below the freezing point when we started at a quarter past eleven on the twenty second the night was beautifully clear and calm with the thermometer at thirteen degrees below zero after a three hours walk we arrived at the north point of a bay three and a half miles wide across which we had come to the bay i gave the name of fraser and to the point that of corcoran after two intimate friends chief traders of the company 
we had not advanced many miles farther when some deer were noticed at no great distance feeding on the banks of a stream being desirous of procuring some venison if possible i sent corrigo who with other good qualities was a very fair shot after them and he was fortunate enough to shoot a fine buck but the buck though wounded could still run too fast to be overtaken and the sportsman was just about to give up the chase when i joined him and we continued the pursuit together the deer having got a considerable way in advance had lain down but rose up before we could get within good shooting distance and was trotting off at a great pace when by way of giving him a parting salute i fired and very luckily sent a ball through his head which dropped him his horns were already about a foot long and the venison was in fine order for the season of the year i immediately returned to the men who had been busily employed collecting fuel of which great quantities grew along the borders of the creek and sent two of them to assist in skinning and cutting up the deer whilst i and the other men continued to gather heather as we now anticipated great doings in the kitchen we placed the greater part of our venison and cash but kept the head blood leg bones etc for present use and being determined to lose nothing the stomach was partially cleaned by rubbing it with snow and then cut up and boiled which thus made a very pleasant soup there being enough of the vegetable contents of the paunch to give it a fine green colour although i must confess that to my taste this did not add to the flavour having discussed this mess a second kettleful was prepared composed of the blood brains and some scraps of the meat which completed our supper it is well known that both eskimo and indians are very fond of the contents of the paunch of the reindeer particularly in the spring when the vegetable substances on which the animal feeds are said to be sweeter tasted i have often seen our hunter nibitabo when he had shot a deer cut open the stomach and sup the contents with as much relish as a london alderman would a plate of turtle soup the position of our snow house was in latitude sixty eight degrees thirty three minutes twenty six seconds north longitude eighty five degrees twenty minutes thirty seconds west both by account the weather was so stormy during the twenty third that we could not continue our journey the thermometer rose as high as plus thirty nine degrees in the shade and the melting of the snow having wet the heather we were obliged to have recourse to alcohol three or four snow buntings and traces of partridges tetrao rupestris were seen on the twenty fourth it still blew a gale of wind from the east but there being a partial thaw by the high temperature there was no drift and much of the ground was entirely cleared of snow in the evening the weather became more moderate and the thermometer fell to five degrees below the freezing point we started at a few minutes after ten o'clock our course being slightly to the east of north the travelling was still very fatiguing as we were frequently forced to pass over the rocks or to walk along the steep drift banks in order to avoid the rough ice which had been heaped up against the shore we passed a number of small bays and points and when we had advanced fifteen miles came to a high cape which forms the northwest promontory of a bay five miles in extent to the cape i gave the name of malaughlin after the gentleman who has been for many years in charge of the columbia department and the bay was called after my much valued friend nicole finlayson esq chief factor after passing cape malaughlin we turned to the eastward toward the head of the bay and stopped at seven a m near the mouth of a creek where we took up our quarters for the day there was not so much fuel to be found as at our last encampment but we gathered enough to boil our kettle some bands of deer and a few partridges were observed but we did not waste time in endeavouring to get a shot at them since leaving fort hope not a day had passed without more or less snow falling which made the travelling much more difficult than i expected and our progress consequently so much slower that notwithstanding the addition i had made to our stock of provisions there was some danger of our still running short i therefore decided on leaving two of the men here to fish and shoot whilst i went forward with the others there was a little snow falling when along with corrigal and matheson i set out at ten p m on the twenty fifth the night was mild six degrees below freezing with a light wind from the east a walk of two miles brought us to a headland which formed the north side of finlayson bay 
and which extended seven miles in a west-northwest direction to this cape the name of richardson was given after the distinguished naturalist who having already exposed himself to many dangers and privations in the cause of science is now about to incur similar hardships in the cause of humanity and friendship by searching for sir john franklin and his gallant party whose situation it is too much to be feared is a critical one at the place where we crossed cape richardson it was not more than a mile wide and we found ourselves in a large bay thickly studded with high and rugged islands the chain of these islands which lay outside of us and to which i gave the name of pomona after the largest island of the orcadian group had effectually served as a barrier to the ice from seaward and had thus made the walking much smoother than we had hoped to find it as we advanced there were many tracks of polar bears and also those of a wolverine that appeared to follow them very closely expecting no doubt to appropriate some portion of whatever prey they might catch a flock of long-tailed ducks passed us flying to the westward towards some open water the vapour exhaled from which appeared in that direction as we approached the north side of the bay which was named after nicholas gary esq of the hudson's bay company there were so many islands that i was much at a loss what direction to take under these circumstances we encamped at six a m on a high island about two miles in diameter from which a good view could be obtained gary bay is the most strangely shaped and the most irregular in its outline of any we had yet seen it presented three long narrow and high points of land and had four inlets the largest and most southerly of these points was called after lieutenant halkett royal navy and the most northerly of the inlets received the name of black inlet as no fuel could be obtained here we were reduced to the necessity of using some more of our alcohol of which but a small quantity now remained the men were soon asleep under our single blanket for this was all the covering we had for the party whilst i remained awake for the purpose of obtaining an observation of the sun at noon this gave latitude sixty eight degrees fifty nine minutes fifteen seconds north variation of the compass eighty eight degrees twenty six minutes west our longitude by account being eighty four degrees forty eight minutes west all the way between lefroy and gary bays there is a range of hills from five hundred to eight hundred feet high about five miles from the coast which was distinguished by the name of his royal highness prince albert consort of our beloved sovereign the weather was beautiful all day and was equally fine when we commenced our march at half past nine at night our route lay somewhat to the west of north between two lofty islands the smaller of which received the name of gladman and the larger and most northerly i designated honeyman after a brother seven miles from our encampment we passed a bluff and precipitous point the northern extremity of gary bay to which the name of cape arrowsmith was given in honor of john arrowsmith esq the talented hydrographer to her majesty the land was now completely serrated with narrow points and inlets along which we were able to make nearly a straight course as the force of the ice from the westward had been much broken by the ridges of rocks that lay outside of us to four of these inlets i gave the names of mackenzie whiffen bunn and hopkins after much esteemed friends towards the end of our night's journey the coast turned nearly due north and when we had advanced seven leagues we encamped on cape miles so named after robert miles esq chief factor at seven a m on the twenty seventh as the morning was exceedingly fine we thought there was no necessity for building a snow house an omission which we regretted in the afternoon when a heavy fall of snow took place by a good meridian observation of the sun the latitude sixty nine degrees nineteen minutes thirty nine seconds north and the variation of the compass ninety two degrees twenty minutes west were obtained the longitude by account being eighty five degrees four minutes west the latter is evidently erroneous as i had neither chronometer nor watch that i could place dependence upon and the compasses were much affected by local attraction our provisions were now nearly all used i could advance only half a night's journey further to the northward and return the following morning to our present quarters 
leaving one of the men i set out with the other at half past nine p m the snow falling fast and although we had little or nothing to carry the travelling was very fatiguing as we crossed baker bay so named in memory of a much valued friend at the north side of which we arrived after a walk of four miles it now snowed so thick that we could not see farther than fifty yards round us and we were consequently obliged to follow the windings of the shore which when we had traced it six miles beyond baker bay turned sharp to the eastward but the weather continuing thick i could not see how far it preserved this trending after waiting here nearly an hour the sky cleared up for a few minutes at four a m which enabled me to discover that we were on the south shore of a considerable bay and i could also obtain a distinct view of the coastline for nearly twelve miles beyond it to the most distant visible point latitude sixty nine degrees forty two minutes north longitude eighty five degrees eight minutes west i gave the name of cape ellis after edward ellis esq member of parliament one of the directors of the company the bay to the northward and the headland on which we stood were respectively named after the distinguished navigators sir edward perry and captain crozier finding it hopeless to attempt reaching the strait of fury and hecla from which cape ellis could not be more than ten miles distant we took possession of our discoveries with the usual formalities and retraced our steps arriving at our encampment of the previous day at half past eight a m here we found that matheson the man left behind had built a snow house after a fashion of his own the walls being like those of a stone building and the roof covered in the same way with slabs of snow placed on the opposite walls in a slanting position so as to rest on one another in the centre seven hours had been spent in building this edifice which was not a very handsome one but being sufficiently wide and when our legs were doubled up a little long enough for us all when lying down we found it pretty comfortable during the remaining four hours of our absence he had been engaged in an attempt to coax a little wet moss into a sufficient blaze to boil some chocolate but notwithstanding his most persevering exertions by the time his fuel was expended the chocolate was little more than lukewarm although our cook pro tempore who was of a sanguine temperament firmly believed that it was just about to reach the boiling point we finished the process with a little of our remaining stock of alcohol and enjoyed an excellent though rather scanty supper matheson was one of the best men i ever had under my command always ready willing and obedient he did his duty in every respect and whilst he possessed spirit enough for anything he had a stock of good humour which never failed him in any situation however difficult and trying were the walking difficult or easy the loads heavy or light provisions abundant or reduced to less than half allowance it was all one to peter matheson he had a joke ready for every occasion a few minutes after ten p m on the twenty eighth we were on the march homeward the night was very disagreeable there being a strong breeze of head wind with heavy snow and a temperature much too mild only eight degrees below the freezing point for walking comfortably the snow was also very soft so that had it not been for the bad state of our victualling department we would have remained snug in our quarters but needs must when hunger drives so we trudged on stoutly crossing over the land for the purpose of shortening our distance after a tough walk during which we met with some tracks of bears that had passed only about an hour before we encamped on a small island close to cape arrowsmith and nearly three miles to the northward of our snow hut of the twenty sixth the weather during the day became fine so fine indeed that our house not being built of good material tumbled down about our ears just before we were leaving it twenty ninth when we started at half past nine p m the night was fine but in half an hour it began to snow so thick that we could not keep our course in crossing gary bay where the walking was much worse than when we formerly passed in three hours the weather again cleared up and i found that we had not deviated much from the right road at seven a m we joined folster and minot whom we found quite well but like ourselves very thin the only animals they had killed were two marmots and no fish had been caught if we had been twelve hours longer absent they intended to have boiled a piece of parchment skin for supper 
and to have kept the small remaining piece of pemmican for travelling provisions i have had considerable practice in walking and have often accomplished between forty and fifty and on one occasion sixty-five miles in a day on snowshoes with a day's provisions blankets axe etc on my back but our journey hitherto had been the most fatiguing i had ever experienced the severe exercise with a limited allowance of food had much reduced the whole party yet we were all in excellent health and although we lost flesh we kept up our spirits and marched merrily on tightening our belts mine came in six inches and feasting our imaginations on full allowance when we arrived at fort hope on the thirtieth we continued our course homewards crossing over the several points that we had formerly coasted it snowed heavily all night and the temperature was only two degrees below the freezing point eight cranes winged their circling flight northward and half a dozen sandpipers were seen it was near four a m on the thirty first when we arrived at our snow house of the twenty third which we found quite as good as when we left it and our cache of venison all safe three partridges were shot which somewhat aided our short commons on the following night after an ineffectual attempt to get to seaward of the rough ice in which we lost a considerable portion of the skin off our shins we travelled on the land making short cuts whenever practicable on arriving opposite to glen island we found that it was divided from the shore by a channel not much more than a quarter of a mile wide there was an inlet a few miles in length to the eastward of it which was named after the rev mr mccarr of kingston canada west this night was the finest we had experienced throughout the journey a specimen of trap rock was obtained from some rising grounds a mile and a half distant from the north shore of smith's bay near the head of which we now for the first time observed a lake of a couple miles in extent when half a league from cape sibold we encamped under the shelter of some precipitous trap cliffs near a hundred feet high some more cranes were seen and numerous traces of deer and partridges we here procured some fuel there being patches of ground bare of snow our latitude by observation was sixty eight degrees nineteen minutes fifty seconds north variation of the compass eighty degrees fifty five minutes west two of the men were affected with snow blindness one of them severely first june it blew a gale of wind from southeast with thick snowdrift at eight hours thirty minutes p m when we resumed our journey at half past ten we crossed the largest stream that we had yet met with on melville peninsula it was already partially open owing to numerous springs which had formed many small mounds of ice from ten to twelve feet high after taking a copious draught from the limpid stream we continued our journey across point barnston and cape finlayson until we arrived at selkirk bay when the weather having become much worse we stopped at one hour thirty minutes a m to build our snow hut at a place where there was such an abundant supply of heather that we had enough to cover our snow bed with two deer were seen and corrigal made an ineffectual attempt to get a shot at them i shot five ptarmigan and four sandpipers were observed during the next night's journey the weather was very snowy but the wind being more moderate we got on faster after coasting selkirk bay we cut across cape lady simpson and at half past six a m on the third of june we reached our encampment of the nineteenth ultimo in erlinson bay where we found our small cache of provisions quite safe five more partridges were shot and some deer seen the snow being very soft we remained here all day and at noon obtained the latitude sixty seven degrees fifty nine minutes north and variation seventy five degrees nine minutes west the thermometer in the shade rose as high as plus fifty four degrees and our old snow house tumbled down about our ears in the evening just as we were going to take our supper perhaps breakfast would be the more appropriate term as we had turned day into night we started at eight hours thirty minutes p m and notwithstanding the great power of the sun so much snow had fallen lately that it lay far deeper on the ground than when we had previously passed this way the walking also was so much more fatiguing that we were not able to reach our snow house of the eighteenth of may and were in consequence under the necessity of building new lodgings 
the night was mild and nearly calm two phalaropes p fulicarius were seen and a couple of ptarmigan shot there was no fuel to be found here but having picked up a little as we came along we did not feel the want of it much the fourth was a fine night with the thermometer at plus twenty three degrees when at seven hours forty minutes we resumed our march whilst rounding cape mctavish we fell in with nine partridges seven of which were shot and i endeavoured to get within range of a couple of swans the first we had seen but they were too shy we now crossed lefroy bay the snow on which was very soft and built our snow house on the ice at seven hours a m about four miles from its south shore the work during this journey had been so much more severe than was expected and the men had in consequence used so much more tobacco than they had anticipated that their stock was now quite exhausted and they appeared to feel the want as much as if they had been deprived of half their allowance of food perhaps more it was really amusing to see how very particular they were in dividing the small remaining bits which they rummaged from the dust and rubbish in their pockets and which at any other time they would have thrown away i happened to have a little snuff with me a pinch of which in their necessity they relished much we were on foot again at twenty minutes after eight on the fifth the weather had been stormy all day but became fine an hour after we started we kept well out from land expecting to find the ice smoother and this was the case as far as point cowie but beyond that the rough ice extended quite across the bay we therefore struck in for the shore which after two hours scrambling we reached and directed our course over the rocks from which the snow had now in many places entirely disappeared towards cape t simpson where we arrived at five hours a m on the sixth and found our cache of provisions etc as we had left it no time was lost in getting the stones cleared away from it not so much for the purpose of having something to eat as to find some tobacco that had been left here among other things a fine hare had been shot and as soon as three of the party who had stopped behind to gather fuel came up we had a much more abundant and palatable meal than we had enjoyed for many days before to the large bay the survey of which we had now completed the name of committee bay was given in honour of the committee of the hudson's bay company this was the finest day we had experienced during this journey the power of the sun being so great as to raise the thermometer to plus eighty two degrees by an excellent meridian observation in quicksilver our latitude was sixty seven degrees nineteen minutes fourteen seconds north variation of the compass sixty four degrees twenty seven minutes west wishing to take a straighter and consequently shorter route to repulse bay than that by which we had gone we started at nine p m on the sixth and after a walk of three hours came to the head of a narrow inlet with high rocky shores and about seven miles long to which i gave the name of munro our course overland was nearly due south and we passed over a number of small lakes from which the snow had been partially removed by the joint action of the sun's rays and the wind on the following night our course continued the same with a slight inclination to the westward we had a strong gale of fair wind which helped us along amazingly but as we could easily reach fort hope in another night and as we had an abundance of food we encamped at three hours thirty minutes a m on the eighth during the whole of which day until late in the evening it blew hard with drifting snow so that no observations could be made being anxious to arrive at winter quarters early on the following day we were again on the march at half past seven p m and the evening having now become fine we kept up a smart pace for a few hours until we arrived at christie lake where finding some very fine heather quite dry and free from snow it was impossible to resist the temptation of having something to eat and drink having taken up our quarters in an old snow hut the chocolate and pemmican kettles were soon on the fire and we heartily enjoyed our rather unusual meal following the lake and the north pole river we came to fort hope at eight hours twenty minutes a m on the ninth all in good health and spirits but very much reduced in flesh although not quite so black as when we returned from the previous journey End of chapter 7
Chapter Eight of Narrative of an Expedition to the Shores of the Arctic Sea in eighteen forty six and eighteen forty seven by John Ray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Shemp. Chapter Eight Occurrences at Fort Hope during the absence of the exploring party. Removed from winter quarters to tents. Sun seen at midnight. Build an oven and bake bread eskimo method of catching seals a concert lateness of the summer a native salmon weir salmon spear boulders on the surface of the ice visited by a native from the ooglit islands his report of occurrences at igloolik indolence of the natives ice breaking up halkett's airboat a storm the ice dispersed prepare for sea during my absence from fort hope little beyond the usual occurrences of the winter had taken place the latter part of may was remarkable for the great quantity of snow that fell with gales of wind and drift which kept the men almost continually clearing away snow from the roofs of our houses they were obliged even to go to work during the night and notwithstanding all the care that was taken two of the boat's yards were broken and the masts very nearly shared a like fate as the post placed under them gave way for so great a quantity of snow lodging on our roof the man left in charge was to blame as shortly after my departure he had the snow thrown up in heaps which when the stormy weather and snowdrift came on caused drift banks to be raised to an equal height about four and a half feet on the tops of our dwellings during all this time the thermometer never fell lower than plus nine degrees which was on the sixteenth of may and rose as high as plus forty five degrees at midday on the twenty ninth the last day of may was very stormy but on the first of june the weather changed for the better although the thermometer was as low as plus twelve degrees on this day the first geese laughing geese and some sandpipers were seen and one of each was shot as the partridges were migrating northward about thirty had been killed and there was a good stock of venison in store the hunters having shot twenty deer the does were now very large with young and had become very poor the bucks were however improving in condition the eskimo had brought in little for trade a few pairs of boots which were soon bought up by the men and a little oil from akiulik being the principal articles some of them were getting short of provisions not having been able to find a cache which they went for they had all behaved well not having committed any thefts that could be discovered we had however one most incorrigible thief among our party ulikbuk's son who during the few days of his father's absence was twice caught with the old man's bale open eating sugar some tobacco was also taken and the trousers of most of the men were completely cleared of buttons by the same hands on my return only one family of eskimo shimakuks remained near us shimakuk had been waiting for his dogs which were with the party who had gone in search of meat on the thirteenth divine service was read and thanks returned to the almighty for his protection throughout the winter and during the late journey there was a strong breeze of north wind with frequent showers of snow house very damp the clay falling from the inside of the walls fourteenth the weather was fine and permitted us to get our flour pemmican etc removed from the meat store which was now dropping much from the roof to the rocks where it was well covered up with oil cloths the twentieth was a most stormy day with occasional showers wind northwest there was a considerable stream of water running on the ice of north pole river forming large pools on the sea ice through which it did not yet find a free exit twenty first there was a change in the weather for the better although it still blew a gale however as the day advanced the wind became more moderate and about noon shifted round to the south the water was rising fast in all the creeks showing that the process of destruction was fast going on among the snow and ice the latter was still nearly four feet thick on the lakes but very porous 
the great rise of water in the creeks and small streams rendered it very unpleasant and even dangerous to cross them in attempting to get near some geese this day i sunk to the waist amid snow and water and not being able to get any firm footing i found much difficulty in scrambling out without wetting my gun twenty third this being a fine day all the men were employed dismantling the house and carrying down the provisions clothes etc to the summer tents which had been pitched about three hundred yards nearer the shore two leather tents were put up for cooking in we saw the sun at midnight his lower limb touching the high grounds to the northward we made some bread in an oven which we had built of stones cemented with clay of an excellent quality the upper part of our first batch was well baked but the floor of the oven was not sufficiently warm to bake the lower part it however rose well and we afterwards succeeded in making excellent bread though the oven was heated with heather footnote recipe seven pounds flour one ounce carbonate of soda three quarter ounce citric acid three quarter ounce common salt water cold about one half gallon the salt soda and acid being finely powdered and dry are to be well mixed together this mixture being well wrought up with the dry flour the water is to be added in two or three parts and mingled with the flour as quickly as possible the dough being put into pans is immediately to be placed in the oven End footnote. 15th july weather still stormy and cold to the feelings the thermometer being plus thirty five degrees the water of north pole lake had broken through its barrier of snow and ice and was rushing down the river with great force carrying with it large masses of ice all the men except flett who remained at the tents and germain who had charge of the nets went to north pole lake on the nineteenth to bring down the boat the river being one continued rapid throughout its whole length with not an eddy to stop in they came down at a rather quick rate but were compelled to stop within a few hundred yards of the salt water on account of the shallowness and the number of stones twenty-two salmon were caught some in good condition others very soft and thin the former contained roe about an eighth of an inch in diameter a number of eskimo arrived for the purpose of catching salmon having finished their seal hunting which had been successful although the number killed could not be ascertained our old friends were accompanied by three strangers viz an old man and two young ones with their wives and families our travelling companion ivitchuk had shot some deer with his gun but having spent nearly all his ammunition he requested and obtained a small additional stock another eskimo a jolly old fellow with two wives joined the party here he had come from the direction of wager river this spring on the ice he and one or two more old men were nearly starved to death last winter being so much reduced that they could not walk twenty-three salmon were got from the nets some of these were in very poor condition being evidently out of season others were in fine order and full of row twenty-second one of the old eskimo at the fishery speared a seal on the ice near the edge of the open water but it got away in consequence of the line breaking their mode of approaching the seal requires much patience and is very fatiguing as the hunter must lie flat on his face or on his side and advance towards the seal by a series of motions resembling those of the animal itself he has frequently to proceed in this way some hundred yards but so well does he act his part that he can get within a few feet of his object and a looker-on would find much difficulty in telling which was the man and which the seal the seal actually comes to meet the hunter who as soon as it has got some distance from its hole springs up and intercepts its return the women are very expert at this mode of hunting and frequently having no spear use a small club of wood with which they strike the seal on the nose the greater part of the eskimo were encamped about a quarter of a mile from us and had a concert every night a union of the vocal and the instrumental their only musical instrument is a sort of drum or tambourine consisting of a stout wooden hoop about thirty inches in diameter round which when it is to be used a wet parchment deerskin is stretched 
in beating this rough instrument the hoop not the skin is struck the performer being in the centre of the tent keeps turning slowly round whilst four or five women add their voices to the execrable sound producing among them most horrible discord each of the men in his turn takes up the drum and thumps away till he is tired when he lays it down and another takes his place and so on it goes until it has passed through the hands of all the males of the party including the boys the whole of the natives with the exception of a few old people who were remaining at the fishing station and three young men and their wives went the following day to an island four miles off for the purpose of killing more seals and also to put new covers on their canoe frames twenty fifth this was the anniversary of our arrival here last year and certainly everything wore a very different aspect from what it then did last summer at this date there was no ice to be seen in repulse bay the snow had nearly all disappeared and the various streams had shrunk to their lowest level now there was not a pool of water in the bay except where the entrance of a river or creek had worn away or broken up the ice for a short distance there was much snow on the ground in many places and most of the streams were still deep and rapid the mosquitoes were rather troublesome but this i was not sorry for as the eskimos said that the ice in the bay would soon break up after these tormentors made their appearance as our native friends were now getting sufficient fish to maintain them they required no further assistance from us at present their mode of catching salmon is a very simple one they build a barrier of stones about one and a half or two feet high across a creek some distance below high water mark the salmon which keep close to the shore at this season are by this means during the ebb of the tide cut off from the sea and are easily speared about sixty were thus killed this day the spear used is usually made of two diverging prongs of muskox horn from four to five inches apart at the extremities between these there is a prong of bone about three or four inches shorter than the outer ones each of the longer prongs is furnished with a barb on its inner side made of a bent nail or a piece of bone which prevents the fish from escaping the handle is six or eight feet long the head of the instrument much resembles a three-pronged fork with the middle prong a little shorter than the others the moon was full this day high water at forty-five minutes past noon arkshuk shimakuk and kei iktu visited us on the twenty-eighth bringing a few pairs of boots for sale the tins which contain preserved meat and table knives and forks were in great demand among these good folks one of the ladies to whom i gave a fork used it as neatly in eating fish as if she had been accustomed to it from childhood thermometer as high as plus sixty degrees in the shade the ice in the bay had broken up for more than a mile from the shore opposite the mouth of the river but some distance out it looked as white and firm as ever i had for some time observed that large stones some of them from one to two tons weight were making their appearance on the ice and i was much puzzled to make out how they came there they could not have fallen from the shore as the beach was sloping at the place nor had they been carried in by drift ice of the previous season the only way that i could account for it was this at the commencement of the winter the ice layer acquiring considerable thickness had become frozen to the stones lying on the bottom and raised them up when the tide came in the stones would gradually get enclosed in the ice as it grew thicker by repeated freezings whilst by the process of evaporation which goes on very rapidly in the spring the upper surface was continually wasting away so that in june and july there was little of the first formed ice remaining and thus the stones which at first were on the under surface of the ice appeared on the top this may perhaps in some measure account for boulders sand shells etc being sometimes found where geologists fancy they ought not to be ice has been time out of mind the great conveyancer august first we were visited this day by an eskimo named Iktuang, whom i had not before seen he had passed the winter near the Uglit Islands, a few days' journey from Iglulik. He said that when a boy, he was frequently on board the Fury and the Hecla in 1822 23. 
and that the Kablunans killed a number of walruses and some black whales with two small boats, that the walruses were put in cash for them, the Eskimo, who were rather short of provisions at the time, and that they received the skins of the whales. They had abundance of provisions last winter, but were visited by a very fatal disease, from what I learnt of the symptoms resembling influenza, which carried off twenty-one grown-up persons. The children were not attacked with this complaint. Two of the party at Igloolik had been reduced to the necessity of putting to death and eating two children, to save themselves from starvation. Four men, whilst hunting the seahorse with their canoes lashed together, were assaulted by this fierce animal struck down with his formidable tusks their canoes capsized and broken and the whole party drowned another poor fellow having early in the winter harpooned a walrus through a hole in the ice was dragged into the water before he could disengage himself from the line the ice being still thin and transparent the body was found a few days after I ictuang also informed me as i had already supposed from various appearances that there is open water throughout the winter between this and the frozen strait through which a strong current runs with the flow and ebb of the tide so strong is it that when bears are pursued and take the water they are often swept under the ice and drowned in the afternoon two more eskimo with their wives from the same quarter accompanied by aki Ulik, and his family made their appearance some of the natives who had taken up their quarters near us were supplied daily with fish they appeared quite as indolent as most of the other savage tribes of america and never thought of looking out for food so long as they could get enough to support life from us although they had a weir made for confining the salmon they would not take the trouble to spear them when in it we endeavored to get some young marmots but without success i find that these curious little animals leave their winter habitations which are usually formed in dry sandy banks as soon as the snow has in great measure disappeared and take up their summer residence among the rocks where i have no doubt they are much safer from their numerous enemies the weather was still fine on the sixth but it appeared to have little effect on the ice in the bay which still remained hard and fast all the largest and deepest lakes were covered with strong ice ninth on looking out this morning i was happy to see a lane of open water stretching completely across the bay but there was still a strong barrier between us and the south point although a passage to the northward might easily have been made the nets produced eighty salmon the greater part of which were given to the eskimo the fishery was now abandoned as we could procure close at hand as many salmon as we required during the whole of our spring fishing halkett's airboat was used for setting and examining the nets and was preferred by the fishermen to the large canvas canoe as it was much lighter and passed over and round the nets with more facility notwithstanding its continued use on a rocky shore it never required the slightest repair it is altogether a most useful little vessel and as i have said before ought to form part of the equipment of all surveying parties whether by land or sea the men from the fishery were followed soon after by the eskimo with their baggage which it took more than a dozen trips of our canoe to ferry over the large lakes were still covered with a thick coat of ice there were a great many seals in the open water and some of the fish in the nets had been eaten by them tenth a storm from the north with rain and snow until noon when the wind somewhat abated and the weather cleared up great havoc was made among the ice and in the evening there was a clear sea as far as the point of the bay eleventh there was a gale of wind all day with rain occasionally the weather cold and unpleasant we were all busily employed in preparing for sea all the snow banks for six or eight feet from the ground having been converted into solid ice soon after the spring thaw commenced we had to dig out the chain and anchor of one of the boats which were buried under ice of that thickness yet on the very spot where this chain and anchor lay there was not a particle of either ice or snow on the twenty fifth july last year such is the variable nature of this northern climate in the afternoon nibitabo was sent to endeavor to get some fresh venison for our voyage and shot two young deer 
st germain and minot set the nets for a supply of salmon and i was busy distributing among the eskimo axes files knives scissors etc 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 the large lakes were still covered with ice but in the bay there was little or none to be seen end of chapter eight chapter nine of narrative of an expedition to the shores of the arctic sea in eighteen forty six and eighteen forty seven by john ray recording by phil Schempf. chapter nine voyage from repulse bay to york factory having got everything ready the boat launched and loaded about two o'clock p m on the twelfth of august i was about to distribute our spare kettles some hoop iron etc among the eskimo when the compass of one of the boats was missing search was made but no compass was to be found at last i thought of turning over some heather that lay close to where my tent had been and there discovered it it had been concealed by one of the eskimo women a widow to whom more presents had been made than to any of the others some of the most decent of the men appeared really sorry at parting and waded into the water to shake hands with me we got under way with a light air of wind from the northeast at twenty-five minutes past two our progress was very slow there being frequent calms so that between pulling and sailing we reached only to within five miles of cape hope at four a m on the thirteenth a large black whale and some white ones with innumerable seals were seen thermometer at plus sixty five but it became much colder after the wind came from sea during the night we sailed among loose ice as it was still calm we anchored at half past four a m to wait for the other boat which was some miles astern to restow the cargo and cook breakfast thermometer at five a m plus forty eight degrees at half past six we began pulling along shore an hour afterwards a light breeze sprung up but still ahead the breeze becoming stronger we hoisted sail and turned to windward and would have made good progress had it kept steady instead of which it followed or rather preceded the sun in his course westward and thus headed us at every point we weathered the flood tide assisted us until four p m when we put ashore as the ebb was too strong for us shot a young arctic hare there is a number of long narrow lakes near the point we stopped at which is formed of gray and red granite and nice and is about five miles from the southeast point of repulse bay caught three species of marine insects with fins which they use like wings preserve specimens of them every appearance of rain this evening thermometer plus sixty five degrees at eight p m fourteenth the wind shifted to the north-northwest at half-past nine last night when we immediately got under way and sailed cautiously along shore examining every bay and inlet when i supposed us near the northern outlet of wager river but not a trace of it was to be seen if it exists i think it is not likely that it should have escaped our notice twice the wind was for a few hours variable and squally but it now shifted to the northeast by north and blew hard in crossing wager river bay eight or ten miles from shore there was a very heavy cross sea which washed over our gunwales occasionally on nearing the shore the run of the sea became more regular but the wind increased so as to make it necessary to reef sails the weather assuming a very threatening appearance and the navigation being intricate and dangerous we were forced to seek a harbor which after some difficulty we found in a small bay at eight p m having run from ninety to ninety-five miles seventy-three of which were measured by massey's patent log two white bears and many walruses were seen on a small island near whale island but the weather was too stormy to permit us to pursue them it had been my intention to cross over to southampton island and trace that portion of the coast from port harding southward which had not yet been surveyed but a stream of ice and the state of the weather prevented my doing so nor did i think it an object of sufficient importance to detain the expedition a day or two for that sole purpose thermometer about plus forty one degrees all day 
the male eider and king ducks appear to have left this coast already there being none but females seen our boat took the ground about half ebb a fine bottom of sand and mud fifteenth it blew a complete gale all night and during the greater part of this day the sky however was sufficiently clear to allow me to obtain a meridian observation for latitude and variation the former was found to be sixty four degrees forty nine minutes six seconds north the latter forty one degrees twenty seven minutes west thermometer plus forty six degrees the wind began to fall in the evening and the tide having come in so as to float the boats we started at four p m under reefed sails the sea was still running high but it was long and regular and as there was every appearance of fine weather i determined to sail all night keeping a sharp lookout ahead for shoals reefs and islets there was a heavy swell all night which broke with great violence on the reefs and it being very dark both boats were once or twice nearly filled by getting into shallow water before we were aware of it sixteenth at half past five this morning we were opposite cape fullerton and at six massey's log was examined and it indicated a run of seventy two miles at nine a m it fell calm thermometer plus forty three degrees an hour afterwards there was a light breeze from the southwest with which we turned to windward among numerous rocky islands at noon the latitude sixty three degrees fifty six minutes thirteen seconds north was observed and shortly afterwards two eskimo were seen coming off in their kayaks paddling at a great rate but the breeze had now freshened and it would have given them hard work to overtake us had we not shortened sail and afterwards landed on an island where we waited for them three more joined us there they were very dirty and far inferior in every respect to our friends of repulse bay one of them was about five feet eight inches high had a formidable beard and moustache and was better looking than the others after making them some presents we shoved off and stood across the bay to the westward of cape fullerton this bay is much deeper than it is laid down in the chart and it is crowded with islands it was near high water when we reached the main shore and as we could make no progress against wind and tide we put into a safe harbour nothing was to be seen for a mile or two inland but rocks clothed in some spots with moss or grass deer were observed and a young one shot by nibitabo about an hour after our landing the wind shifted to the west northwest and as i was afraid of getting aground in our present berth the boats were moved to a more open situation from which they could start at any time of tide the eskimo could tell us nothing about churchill none of them having visited that place either this or the previous summer thermometer at nine p m plus fifty three seventeenth we were under way at two a m but the wind was both light and close so that our progress was slow before the tide changed it came more from the southward we were therefore obliged to anchor as soon as it began to ebb the latitude of our harbor was sixty three degrees forty seven minutes thirty three seconds north variation thirty one degrees eight minutes west the rocks like those where we landed last night were gray granite and nice thermometer at noon plus sixty degrees a large black whale was seen this morning at half past one p m the tide began to flow and at two we were under sail the wind having gone round to the northward so as to permit us to lie our course along shore a succession of reefs lines the coast which is itself very irregular in its outline being indented with numberless inlets some of them running many miles inland the tide began to ebb at eight p m and as the wind had fallen and headed us we ran inshore and cast anchor under the shelter of some rocks it was just getting dark when a fresh breeze of fair wind sprung up this was annoying enough at ten o'clock nine eskimo visited us but stayed only a short time as we were to stop near their tents in the morning two of them said they would sleep on the rocks near us with the intention of pointing out the deepest channel when we should resume our voyage eighteenth we started at daylight this morning but the fair wind which had continued all night soon failed us aided by the flood tide however 
an hour's rowing brought us to the encampment of our last night's visitors who welcomed us with much noise and soon brought to the beach a number of furs and other articles for trade they were very easy to deal with apparently putting implicit confidence in our honesty nor were they losers by this conduct ammunition was the article chiefly in demand as they had two guns among the party files knives fire steels etc were distributed among the men and beads needles buttons etc among the women one of the women was rather good-looking but they were all much darker than the natives of repulse bay they were well provided with food as they had a large seal lying on the rocks besides venison it was still calm when we left them but favored by the ebb tide we pulled out of the inlet and shaped our course towards chesterfield inlet which we crossed with the last of the flood the day was beautiful far too much so and the few light airs of wind were all against us we landed in a small cove on the south side of the inlet to pick up a deer that was shot from the boat four more deer were killed but all in poor condition about two miles to the northward of the inlet i obtained a meridian observation of the sun in the natural horizon which gave latitude sixty three degrees thirty two minutes zero seconds north thermometer at noon plus sixty five degrees and in the evening plus seventy degrees the mosquitoes were very numerous and troublesome numbers of turnstones tringa interpres were seen nineteenth there was a fine breeze again all last night which died away at daylight as soon as the flood tide began to come in we started with a light wind fair enough to allow us to lie our course along shore for a few miles it again fell calm when we took to the oars and landed on a point five miles to the southward of our last night's harbour where we breakfasted at nine a m dove keys in countless numbers were sitting on the stones and swimming along the shore footnote the dove key or black guillemot uria grilla breeds in great numbers in the orkney islands i believe ornithologists are mistaken in supposing that this bird becomes white or rather grey during the winter it is only the young birds that are so the old ones seen in the winter without any change in color of their summer plumage End footnote. one or two pintailed and mallard ducks were seen on a lake a few hundred yards inland the first we have seen since passing neville's bay last year some dove keys eggs were found with the birds formed in them having obtained a meridian observation of the sun which gave for the latitude sixty three degrees seventeen minutes zero seconds north and variation nine degrees twenty one minutes west we got under way and beat to windward with the last of the ebb which here ran to the south there was a fine breeze but we made only about five miles southing when at six p m the flood set in strong against us we put ashore for the night under the lee of the point it was not easy to find a harbour all the coast from chesterfield inlet being flat and stony and lined with shoals a young buck was shot but it was in poor condition thermometer at noon plus sixty three degrees at eight p m plus fifty seven degrees some of the copper came off our boat to-day and stopped her way before it was observed twentieth we came under way this morning by daylight but the wind was right ahead and blowing fresh some more copper came off the boat and she was evidently out of trim as the magnet went fast to windward of us she had become leaky also and therefore i determined to lay her aground as soon as the tide turned we had gained between six and seven miles when finding that we made but slow progress i put on shore at the first place that offered shelter a little before noon several deer were seen and a large buck shot which i was surprised to find very lean at this season near repulse bay they are in fine condition thermometer at noon plus sixty one degrees at half past two the wind changed to west northwest but it blew a gale before the tide flowed sufficiently to float us we could do nothing but haul out into deeper water to be ready by dawn next morning some pintails mallards and hutchins and laughing geese were seen here also a brood of well-grown young king ducks in a small lake at some distance from the sea with which it had no connection 
just as our boats floated the wind became more moderate and as we still had an hour and a half of daylight we sailed along the coast for four and a half miles being forced to keep some miles from shore to avoid shoals soon after sunset we ran into a bay for shelter during the night in doing so we grazed some ridges of stones but found good anchorage in four fathoms of water thermometer plus forty seven degrees twenty first thermometer plus forty four degrees there was a strong breeze with heavy squalls from the north all night on starting at daylight and making for the only outlet that appeared we found it too shallow and so were forced to wait the flow of the tide the wind was west by north but gradually shifted round against us and became very light we managed however to reach an island near the north point of rankin's inlet although there was a fine breeze it being right ahead nothing was to be gained against the ebb tide we found many old sign of eskimo visits to the island among other articles picked up were an ivory snow knife a drill for producing fire and an iron drill also some vertebrae of a whale measuring ten inches in diameter there were numerous graves of eskimo here with spears lances etc deposited beside them most of these articles were old and much corroded with rust but a very excellent seal spearhead had been placed there this spring thermometer at noon plus fifty two degrees eight p m plus forty seven degrees temperature of water plus forty one degrees twenty second thermometer plus forty two degrees at a little before five this morning the wind shifted to the south southeast we set out to cross rankin's inlet although we could not lie our course and after five hours sailing reached an island near the south shore where we landed as the breeze had increased to a gale and gone more to the southward with a heavy sea which washed over us occasionally we here picked up some specimens of copper ore but the ore did not appear to be abundant the aurora was very bright last night it appeared first to the south southeast moved rapidly northward spreading all over the sky and finally disappearing in the north this agrees with what wrangle asserts that the aurora is affected by the wind in the same way as clouds are heavy rain and a strong gale from noon until eight p m temperature of water plus forty two degrees air plus forty three degrees twenty third the wind was right ahead but light this morning we got under way and beat to windward some miles alternately sailing and pulling until we reached the north point of corbett's inlet we were here visited by eighteen eskimo in their kayaks all the news that they could give us was that one of ulugbuk's sons had passed the winter near this place and that he had walked to churchill in the winter where all were then well a brisk trade was soon opened the articles of greatest request being powder and ball some fox and wolf skins were received but before they had brought out the half of their stock the wind changed from the southwest to the northwest by west and blew a gale which soon raised a sea that washed over the canoes alongside being anxious to take advantage of the fair wind to cross corbett's inlet before dark after making our friends presents of various articles we set sail and ran across the inlet encountering a heavy sea caused by a swell from the south meeting the waves raised by the present gale we were three hours crossing to the south point of the inlet off which lie some dangerous reefs five or six miles from land the wind was very close as we turned the point and after gaining six miles further we were forced to make a number of tacks before getting into a harbor which proved to be an excellent one landlocked on all sides little soil was to be seen on the rocks which were of granite we had shipped a good deal of water and it was past nine p m when we got under shelter thermometer plus forty five degrees hundreds of gray phalaropes were seen supposed to be phalaropus fulicarius twenty fourth it blew so hard this morning that we could not start until eight o'clock the wind after that moderated gradually and latterly fell calm by rowing we arrived at the southeast end of the island near whale cove where we were visited by a party of natives who brought off some furs and boots for trade footnote 
this place is laid down on the chart as an island but it is a peninsula according to the account we received from the eskimo End footnote. a breeze from the south southeast sprung up about one o'clock with which we turned to the windward through a narrow channel between a small island and the main when we reached the open sea the wind was too much ahead for us to advance against the ebb tide and as a convenient harbor offered itself we anchored for the night our latitude at noon was sixty two degrees thirteen minutes nineteen seconds after which we advanced about four miles to the southward Uligbuk told us that when a little boy about seven years old he visited this place with his parents and went out to see horse island on the ice to hunt the animals from which it takes its name three large black whales were seen today thermometer plus forty six degrees plus fifty three degrees and plus forty two degrees i was much pleased to observe that the nearer we approached to churchill the more confidence the eskimo placed in us they fixed no price for their goods but threw them on board the boat and left it to me to pay them what i pleased this confidential mode of dealing which is not in keeping with the habits of the eskimo tribes at least shows that they are satisfied with the treatment they receive at churchill to the hudson's bay company indeed they have much reason to be grateful for having by their influence at last created a friendly feeling between them and the chippewayans with whom they used to be at constant and deadly enmity twenty fifth there was a heavy rain all last night which continued until between nine and ten o'clock this morning we then got under way with the first of the flood but it fell calm we rode for fourteen or fifteen miles the rain pouring all the time a fine breeze from the north by east sprung up at four p m before which we ran direct for the passage between sir bibai's islands but finding the water become very shallow and learning from uligbuk that there was not water enough for the boats except at full tide we kept outside the islands altogether we reached the mainland at a little after sunset at the south point of neville's bay and ran for shelter into a small inlet separated on the south by a narrow point from a deep river to which the eskimo resort to catch salmon thermometer plus thirty seven degrees and plus forty one degrees as the moon was full i at first intended running on all night but the threatening look of the weather deterred me twenty sixth last night about an hour after casting anchor the moon became overcast and it blew a perfect gale on landing this morning we found a quantity of wood a large sled thirty feet long and some slender pieces of wood fastened together to the length of forty feet there were two of these poles which are used by the natives for spearing small seals it is said that in davis's straits the eskimos use poles of the same kind for spearing whales as the bay in which we were lying was not very safe should the wind change we got under way and turned into the mouth of the river under close reefed sails the boats shipped much water particularly the magnet keeping a man constantly bailing we at last got under the lee of a point where there was a sandy bottom but not water enough to float the boats at low tide the river is about a mile broad and deep enough in the middle for a vessel drawing twelve or fourteen feet water we saw a number of whalebone snares set along the edges of the lake for geese large flocks of which were feeding about but very shy there was a storm from north northwest all afternoon with heavy rain thermometer plus thirty six degrees twenty seventh it felt very cold this morning the thermometer was at the freezing point and there was some snow the storm had continued all night with increasing strength but towards daylight the weather became more moderate so that about nine o'clock we were able to start under reefed sails the breeze gradually died away and went round to the southwest and it finally became calm heavy rain and sleet began to fall the wind veered round to the southeast so that we could lie our course and make good progress with the flood at six p m we reached a bay a few miles north of knapp's bay which i had not noticed on our outward voyage and which is not laid down on the charts it is about ten miles wide and eight deep the water in it is very shallow nowhere exceeding ten feet and as it was within an hour or two of high water the greater part of it must be dry when the tide is out 
numbers of brent geese were feeding in all directions on a marine plant zostera marina linnaeus which grows here in great abundance we anchored under the lee of an islet in knapp's bay a very small portion of which was visible at high water thermometer plus thirty eight degrees twenty eighth we were under way at daylight this morning with a strong breeze of northwest wind which made us close reef our sails there was a heavy sea in knapp's bay at eight a m we passed to the westward of the island under which we found shelter during the gale of the eighth of july last the wind was cold with occasional showers of rain great numbers of geese were seen passing to the southward in the evening the wind became more moderate and finally calm our water kegs being empty i ran inshore a little before sunset and entered egg river in which we found a safe harbor this river discharges a considerable body of water into the sea by five mouths separated by four islets there is no island lying opposite to its mouth as represented in the charts thermometer from plus thirty five degrees to plus forty degrees twenty ninth the boat lay afloat all night which was fine but dark there was not a breath of wind until seven o'clock an hour after starting a moderate breeze sprung up from the west by north but soon became light and variable and at last it fell calm a short time before sunset when having gained about forty miles we pulled into a small bay which afforded us good shelter the day was fine throughout with occasional light showers of rain thermometer from plus forty five degrees to plus fifty two degrees the sky was too much overcast for me to obtain any observation but it appears to me that egg river is laid down in the charts about twelve miles too far to the southward and egg island is twelve miles south of the river instead of being near its mouth as there represented thirtieth we had thirteen feet of water last night when the tide was in but it was not until the flood had made two hours that we floated the night was as fine as the last and calm there was a light air of west wind when we got under way with which and the flood tide we slipped along shore pretty fast in an hour or two the wind began to fly about from all points with calms between so that even with the help of our oars we only made twenty-two miles and not being able to reach seal river we ran into a small bay the only spot that appeared clear of stones for some miles about twelve miles north of it here abundance of driftwood was found with which the men lighted fires sufficiently large for the coldest winter night the evening was very warm and the mosquitoes were troublesome the country inland is well wooded great numbers of mallard teal pintails and long-tailed ducks were seen but only two or three were shot thirty-first left our harbor as soon as the tide permitted which was at seven a m a light but fair breeze from the north by west gradually increased so that we made a fine run across buttons bay which is full of rocks and shoals as represented in the charts and entering churchill river a few minutes after one p m landed in a small cove a few hundred yards above the old fort on visiting the company's establishment i found that mr sinclair was absent at york factory but i was very kindly received by mrs sinclair and liberally supplied with everything we required for the continuation of our voyage as we had carried away our bowsprit turner was set to make a new one i received many letters from much valued friends and after remaining for a few hours returned to the boats at nine p m in order to be prepared for starting early in the morning should wind and weather prove favorable the stock of provisions on hand was eight bags of pemmican and four hundred weight of flour we left Uligbuck and his son at churchill third september for the last two days the wind had been fair but blowing a gale with such a heavy sea that we could not proceed the weather was so cloudy that i could obtain no observations i therefore employed most of my time in shooting eskimo curlews which were so abundant near the old fort that i bagged seven brace in a few hours this morning the wind shifted more to the westward and becoming more moderate we got under way at nine a m there was still a heavy swell outside and at the entrance of our little harbor 
whilst coming out in the dawn of the morning three seas came rolling in one after the other and broke completely over the bows of the boat washing her from stem to stern i thought she would have filled but we got into deep water before any more seas caught her the magnet was even more roughly handled in following us having shipped much water and struck heavily on the rocks fortunately without damage the wind died away and during the morning shifted to south we however reached cape churchill and at eight p m cast anchor under its lee exactly opposite an old stranded boat fourth we had a breeze from southwest by south today which enabled us to get along the coast sixteen or eighteen miles during the flood it blew so hard in the afternoon that we required to double reef our sails the weather was very warm the thermometer being as high as plus sixty degrees in the shade a canada nuthatch sitta canadensis flew on board today and was very nearly caught there were a good many ducks and geese near the place where we landed to get fresh water between thirty and forty of the former and two of the latter were shot the boats were allowed to take the ground after two hours ebb on a fine shingle beach on which a considerable surf was breaking fifth it was calm all night at three this morning the boat floated and we pushed out a short distance from shore to be ready for the first fair wind at half past seven a light air sprung up from the northeast but did not increase till past noon when there was a fine breeze a meridian observation of the sun gave latitude fifty eight degrees twenty six minutes fourteen seconds north at five p m we were opposite the mouth of broad river latitude fifty eight degrees seven minutes zero seconds north thermometer at noon plus fifty six degrees sixth we were under way this morning a little before daylight with the wind from northeast the weather was so thick that we could not see more than a hundred yards ahead we however ran on by soundings until i thought we were near north river and then kept inshore until we got sight of land which proved to be close to nelson river across which we stood directing our course by compass and coming in directly opposite the beacon we arrived at york factory between nine and ten o'clock p m and were warmly welcomed by our friends who had not expected to see us until next summer in justice to the men under me let me here express my thanks for their continued good conduct under circumstances sometimes sufficiently trying in fact a better set of fellows it would be difficult to find anywhere as to their appearance when we arrived at york factory i may adopt the words of corporal mullaren in charge of the sappers and miners who are to accompany sir john richardson by george i never saw such a set of men end of chapter nine end of narrative of an expedition to the shores of the arctic sea in eighteen forty six and eighteen forty seven by john ray